Hello and welcome, I'm Jay. And I'm Robbie. And you're joining us for episode 15 of Generations Apart, the podcast where we talk about gaming and technology across the generations, sharing our excitement for the future and our perspectives on the past. Today, we're talking about 3D printing, and we're specifically getting into all the things you need to know to get yourself started. So if you've got a project in mind and you're not sure which way to go, hopefully by the end of this episode, you will. But before we get into that, Robbie, what's piqued your interest this week? Okay, so this week I'm going to stick with the norm. It's going to be another chat GPT week. Um, but specifically, um, there's more and more applications for chat GPT and, and offshoots of chat GPT. But what I found, what I discovered recently, is the ability to put it into your phone. So I, I've got an iPhone and I came across this video by um, someone called Brandon Butch who did a, a bit of a demo on how to get ChatGPT on your phone in the form of SGPT, which is a shortcut that you can install, pre-install from, from GitHub. And so I've got this on my phone now, and it's actually, it's really, really quite clever the way it works. Because it's a shortcut and it's built into iOS and it's built into Apple, it can interact with all the iOS apps as well. So the example that he has on, on the video um, is create me a playlist of the top 10 songs by Oasis. Um, and then call the playlist X uh, is like the prompt. You can text type the prompt. Um, it just comes up as a as a bit of a pop out um, as you click on the shortcut, or uh, you can speak it just by using the you know the natural um, speaking uh, the option when you instead of typing your your voice. Yes, your voice. No, but there's a little <laughs> there's a little uh, you can speak microphone it using thing. your voice. The little microphone <laughs> thing, so you can speak to text. Anyway, so you can talk to it, and that's what he does in the video, um, and it creates it goes off and it finds the the list of the top songs that you looked for how you requested and um, it compiles that in a list and then it interacts with apple music in the background to create a playlist and then add those songs to the playlist and you can see like the history of what it's doing um and so i just thought this was a really cool example of having chat gpt in your phone uh, i think it's chat gpt 3 uh, or 3.5 i think is the version that you use for this um, but if you pay for the extra version i think you can get more um but yeah, a really cool way of getting it into your phone. And you can use the other stuff that you might use it for as well, like generating bunches of texts. Um, I generated some lyrics for a song the other day, which is quite fun on my phone. Um, but yeah, the fact that it interacts with iOS and other Apple apps as well, I just thought was a, a really cool implementation. It's a bit um, it's a bit fiddly setting it up. Not too fiddly, but you do have to set up a, an account on OpenAI and get some API credentials that you just kind of paste in uh, the, the shortcut when you first add it. But uh, once that's added, then you've got it on your phone forever. Um, so yeah, that was uh, what piqued my interest this week. Just thought a really cool on the phone version of ChatGPT. Yeah, it's really cool. I, I think I shared a few um, examples on LinkedIn a long, long, well, a long time ago. It can't have been that long ago. A few weeks back of a similar implementation. Um, I haven't years myself, ago so in uh, ChatGPT. Years ago, in, yeah, years ago in terms of tech development. But um, yeah, I haven't done. I haven't actually done it myself. Um, so I may well I may well follow this if you recommend it and give it a go. Mm. Um, I wonder if um, when you get or if you pay for access to GPT four whether the uh, setup is the same because I think I am considering paying for the premium to try it out because I'm hearing incredible things about GPT four and, and how much more advanced it is than GPT three. So I'd be quite interested to see that in action. Yeah. Um, yeah. Worth fascinating noting that... how fast it's moving. It's worth noting that this isn't free, so you still have to pay even though it's ChatGPT3, and that's just because you're using the APIs instead of the standard interface through uh, the platform. Okay. But yeah, it's pennies say the API compared to, part of that. I think ChatGPT4 is much more expensive. Um, but yeah, apps like pennies that you'll be spending on, on API calls. Um, but yeah, it's just the fact that it, uh, it, it pops out, and it's even, if you've got a dynamic island on your phone, if you've got iPhone 14 or, or uh, newer, um, in fact, that is the newest, I think you can get newer than that. Um, <laughs> it actually interacts with that as well. So you have a little loading bar and the dynamic island at the top and these uh, little pop-ups pop out from there um, and give you extra steps from, from what you're requesting. It's really quite clever. What I think is really funny is that it's just a million times better than Siri <laughs> already. And it's a shortcut that someone just built online. Um, yeah, Probably really had a little bit more money invested in it though 
in terms of the back end infrastructure than Siri. I think, I mean, Siri, not that Siri's cheap, but I imagine OpenAI and GPT, especially in the last six or 12 months, has, um, is probably getting money thrown at it left and right. So. Well, it's open source yeah, now, I mean, so there's no reason why it's Siri not a could adopt it's it. Not, it's not a secret, is it, that the Siri's a bit meh mm. compared to its competitors anyway. So I think if you then stick uh, GPT-3 uh, underneath whatever you're uh, interacting with, you're probably going to get a better result. But um, interesting. I wonder how or if that could be extended to things like the HomePods, because that's obviously all Siri-driven as well. Yeah. Is there any way to interact with that? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, cool. Well, let's keep it on. Uh, let's keep the theme. My interest uh, this week was piqued by another chat GPT story. Just Here we to, go. Yeah, yeah, just mix it up a bit. AI hour. This time they're in gaming <laughs> and maybe a glimpse into the future of open world games. So um, there, was a, there was a modder uh, in the modding community who has taken um, Skyrim, because of course Skyrim mm-hmm. hasn't already been modded or ported enough. Hasn't got enough mods. And they have managed to uh, effectively mod in uh, GPT-3 driven um, character uh, voices or driven narratives. Uh, so in, if you've played, I mean, I'll, I'll hold my hands up now and say I've never played Skyrim. You never I played, played Skyrim? First, I first you played the first for hour or two. Games. <laughs> you know, first hour or two did nothing for me. I don't like any of the stuff that came before it. I'm not into that kind of world. I prefer sort of futuristic video <laughs> games rather than sort of medieval or you know, fantasy. Mm. Um, although I absolutely recognize how good it is before anyone starts off at me. It's just <laughs> not my bag. And that's okay. You don't have to like all games. But um, I obviously recognize, and I've got friends who've played it and loved it, how popular this game is and how uh, immersive the open world is. But of course, in any game, there is a limit to what the characters can say or do because they're pre-programmed. Yep. So the idea here is that this modder has managed to get uh, the non-playable characters to utilize GPT um, so that when you're interacting with them, uh, it will come back with a creative a response, theoretically unlimited in terms of its responses, to then interact with the character. Now, it's a little janky. So uh, when you ask the characters any question, they go, let me think, which is the prompt for loading. Because <laughs> in the background, it's sending that query off. GPT-3 is processing it. Um, and then it brings it back, and then it uses uh, text-to-speech to read it back to you in a very robotic way. But uh, as a first glimpse into where this could go, I think it's really interesting. Now, this has been done by Modder. It's not been done with huge budget or huge amounts of, of, of coders. I'm sure this person is very talented. But imagine where this could go in the future if your open-world game uh, has this is, is effectively powered by GPT-3, and it's aware of the law and conscious of the environment I think it could be really interesting. And they show a few examples. There is a video in the article. We'll link it in the show notes as usual. Um, but what you'll see in there when you, when you watch it is that these NPCs are even able to reference the time of day. Um, so there's one where they ask a shopkeeper what time the shop is open till. And he's able to tell you what time it is in game at that moment and when the shop closes. Um, and they're able to interact with items that you show them. So at one point they show one of the characters of a particular sword, and he comes back and explains only the basic stuff that would be in the game wiki. But he talks to you and tells you what the sword is, um, which is not something that they could normally do. So I think it's really interesting. Um, like I said, the implementation is really janky, but it's more of a, hey, look what you could do, rather than a, hey, look what I've done, and you should all enjoy this for what it is. It's, it's a glimpse into the future, I think, of where open world games could go. And I just think it's fascinating to see you know, the sorts of things that you could be doing with these NPCs and these immersive worlds in the future. Now, the other thing I was going to quickly say is if you then strap VR onto that, mm. imagine a cyberpunk, high visual fidelity in VR, where all the characters are able to come up with creative responses, no matter what you ask them or when, set within the context of the universe they're told they're in. I think that could be really cool. Um, or they may be too immersive, perhaps. That's wild. Know. It's getting almost to. Uh, have you ever seen Westworld? Well, I was going to say that's it's kind of all, <laughs> along those lines, isn't it? It's stepping into that kind of uncanny valley, uh, you know, metaverse yeah. step again. But um, you should you should watch it. As I say, it's it's not great. Like the text to speech sounds ropey, um, and it <laughs> even pronounces things wrong. So it'll go and it'll say things like the shop is open from nine am to nine pum <laughs> instead of trying to say the letters. But it's fun, you know. And and like I said, it's something that. It's, they're just showing off a tech demo effectively. But, um, you know, if, if this is something that game developers are going to start to look at, 
it could be really exciting for open world games in the future. I love that games are adopting this stuff because I don't think it's just the narratives you can use it for as well. I was speaking to someone the other day who suggested that you might have procedurally generated bits of the map that were generated by code that could be requested from uh, ChatGPT or something like that. Um, or have just GPT related content dra- uh, like created all over the map. Um, which I think is really cool. But yeah, I love the fact that the narrative is already starting to be tinkered with. Um, well, yeah, it's interesting cool. as well is the person who's done this is also, it, it talks about this in the article, the person who's done it is also looking at how to give the characters memory so that when they've talked to you and they've had a conversation with you before, they will remember what they've said to you and, how, and the conversation you've had so that it, and, that, and that they've met you. So that interaction the next time around kind of follows on and is, is more natural rather than, hey, I've never spoken to you before, traveller. Like, and then it all starts again. They'll actually remember you and the conversations that you've had and what you said to them. Oof, that's going to start to get really mm. creepy. <laughs> I know, it is getting, it's getting to that point, isn't it? But um, it's exciting, interesting. <laughs> very, very interesting. I love it. It's just, I think, Phil, like this entire year so far has been, uh, it's almost like every sci-fi film you've watched over the last 10, 15, 20 years is all of a sudden coming through. The Matrix is feeling frighteningly realistic at the moment. Yeah. Um, you know, Ready Player it, One. Yeah. Well, Ready Player One, definitely. Um, but, you know, we're at this point now where you could theoretically have a computer procedurally generate a world and then interact with you in you know, such a way that you'd almost never know you weren't in that world. Ooh, God, no, and that's like that effectively idea. what the Matrix is, isn't it? You know, yeah. if you take the whole battery-powered human race thing out of it, it's computers are manipulating the human mind into believing it's in a world that it's not actually in. Creepy. Yeah, no. <laughs> Could be. Anyway, that's enough doom and gloom about the, the AI chat GPT apocalypse. Um, let's get into the show and, and what we're covering today, which, as we said at the top, is 3D printing. Mm-hmm. So should caveat this whole episode by saying I am far from an expert in this. I would call myself an enthusiast, um, which is my get out for anything when I talk from a position of knowledge. <laughs> about anything um but robbie i i'm right saying you have really not dabbled at all with 3d printing that's at this point so. that's right yeah i've seen it at like conventions and, and expos and things like that um but i haven't in fact i've seen it like live make something as well and uh there's different types i know that that's pretty much it I'm, i can't tell you which one was the one that i saw um the one where it was like printing on top of each other uh little kind of rings and stuff um i remember actually what i got it was a it was back when Game of Thrones was really popular and it was a doorstop that said Hodo on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> which I just like thought it. was quite I clever. Like but they were just 3D printing loads of that stuff. Um, so that's my only okay. experience with it. So we'll, we'll try and start right at the beginning. So I'm going to assume that anyone listening to this has got some sort of a knowledge or an interest that perhaps hasn't done any real reading. So I guess first things first, let's start with the basics. And I know you know this, Robbie. So how does 3D printing work? So effectively, for, for those who've never experienced it, 3D printing uh, is taking a 3D file, so something like an STL file that you might make on a computer using a program like Blender, or I think it used to be 3D Studio Max. I'm not sure what it's called these days. That's what it was called when I was at college. Um, or any of the other tools on the market that, that you can use now to sculpt or um, use like CAD software to create objects in 3D. And then what it does is you use an application uh, called a slicer, Um, which basically takes that 3D file and breaks it down into a number of layers. And those layers will depend on the quality of print that you're after, um, but they're normally well in the hundreds, depending on whatever file you're going to produce. could be into the thousands, depending on the complexity of the object, the size of the object, um, or the, like I said, the depth, the resolution, if you want to call it that. And Mm -hmm. and that's often how it's referred to, which just feels a bit weird to (laughs) refer to things in the human world as as having a resolution because that's something you typically associate with a computer. Um, And for home use, there's basically two types of 3D printer that you can go for, depending on what it is you're trying to do. You've got the sort of filament extrusion 3D printers, um, and then you've got the resin 3D printers, and both work quite differently, but ultimately produce kind of similar things. There are, should be said, um, a whole load of other applications of 3D printing in science and chemicals and industry and like you know medicine and all sorts of weird stuff that we're not going to get into where this is this is home hobbyist territory we're going to stay in so what you were describing then robbie sounds like the uh, the filament the extrusion method um which effectively 
uh, depending on the printer, either has um, a sort of platform bed that the file will, will be printed on that will that can move in different directions, um, as well as a, a nozzle on a frame mm. that sits above the printing bed, which then effectively melts a stream of plastic filament um, and then extrudes it onto a base plate. Uh, and it will basically draw these layer files out for you. So if you imagine taking your 3D object and slicing it, you know, on a chopping board, like you might, you know, a chef might slice an onion mm. very, very finely into a number of layers, the printer will then take each layer and one by one print them from the bottom up. So the filament printer, um, typically they are larger in size, so larger beds, larger, larger prints that you can produce with them. Um, certainly at an entry level at least if you're sort of comparing the two you're going to get a much bigger print for your money with filament printers um they will again both printers will take hours and hours to print but these basically will just draw one layer at a time yeah by extruding this hot plastic out of a small nozzle and then moving up a millimeter and doing it again and up a millimeter and doing it again and that goes on on and on and on and on and on throughout the hundreds of layers required to print your object and at the end of the print you will have a solid plastic object depending and i say solid that very much depends on how you choose to print it but you will have a solid piece of plastic that has, that has cooled in the shape that you wanted it um loads of complexity i say loads of complexity it's not that complex but there's loads of additional things to consider mm. when doing this um so you'll find that a lot of these objects tend to be quite light and um, because that although they are solid plastic they're not solid in terms of their density they are they tend to be hollow and what you'll find these slicing tools will do is they create like um, varying degrees of uh, like a honeycomb structure that sits inside yeah. the object. So rather than just flooding it with plastic, which <laughs> obviously would cost you a fortune and would weigh a ton, it will draw out um, supporting grids inside the structure to give it rigidity. And it will also draw, um, or it will also build you what are basically called construction, um, construction lines or construction rods that will basically print around your object so that as it's printing, it doesn't sort of flop over, collapse on the build plate under its own weight. So if you've got something, um, I can think of an example. If you were doing something like the letter C, for example, mm. from the base up, there's going to come a certain point where that, that C's got to arc over itself. And if it's not supported under its own weight, it's likely to fall over or flop onto the base plate. Um, so you'll Does it do that, that automatically uh, or does that have to be in the design? Uh, so the, soft, the slicing software typically does that. For wow. you. um so it, you okay. can use you can get pre-supported stl files so you will find that a lot of the and we'll talk about it later a lot of places that you can buy 3d uh, files and objects for printing at home will often come pre-supported and you'll have the option to support it yourself mm. because some people have their own way of doing it and their printers have certain requirements or or they've kind of worked out through trial and error the best way to to support their models and um, but you can also have them pre-supported and um, the, the handful of prints that i've done I've tended to use the built-in software's uh, own attempts to support it, and that's been fine. I haven't had any fail prints myself, but I've done only just a you know, very sparing number of prints, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, so with the filament printers, as I said, they tend to be much bigger. Um, the Commonly, between the two types, the filament printers tend to be less refined in terms of the out final output. Um, so the resolution tends to be a little harder to dial in. Mm. You tend to see the the I guess the layer lines more clearly on the object. So if you're handling a 3D print, and I would love to show something on screen for those watching on YouTube, but frankly, I don't think the camera will pick it up well enough to to do it any kind of justice. But if you look at a 3D printing object, one that's come off a filament printer especially, you'll notice there is um there are very, very fine lines across it. And I don't really know how else to describe it, but yeah. you like you ran your finger over it, it's not smooth. So a surface that should be smooth will have ever so slight um, ridges on it. And, yeah. and that's basically because each, each layer has been dropped one on top of the other. So they're that's, not, that's, it's I was going to say smooth. that's one thing I did notice about the, the hot or door stuff. <laughs> it was very jagged. Um, low resolution is a great way to describe it because it is, it's as if it was a, yeah. um, like a, an image on the PC that was rendered in low resolution, was kind of what it looks like. Um, so it was yeah. a bit jagged, like the text had a bit of jagged edges. Um, and the stacking you can see as well. It almost looks like if you had a big stack of paper um, that was kind of lined up really well, but you could still see, you know, that there was paper stacked on top of each other. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind a of great what it example. Like. It's like almost like a deck of cards, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. You look sideways on, and and that's almost the 
that's where the resolution comes in. So you might describe it as paper. Someone else might describe it as card. Someone else might describe it as something even thicker. It depends on what the, the print quality is that's been done as to yeah. as to how smooth or how indeterminable those layers are. Um, and that, and then the the decision really comes down to the quality of printer that you bought. So what is the what is that? What types of what can it deal with? The types of filament um, in this in, or the plastic that you're using in um, in that type of printer's case, and um, but also the number of layers that you want your object sliced into and how long you're prepared to wait for it to print, because the more layers you break it down into, the less likely you are to see the layers. Now, where the, where the filament printer tends to come in really handy is, or where they're more commonly used, um, as, as far as I'm aware, a larger scale print. Mm. Or um, if you're printing parts or you're prototyping a product. So because, they're, because you can kind of print them quick and dirty, they're pretty easy just to sort of dump the file on, prep the material and leave it to it. They're, they're really good for knocking out simple um, prototypes. And you'll quite often see them. I watch a lot of YouTubers who, who craft or make things. Yeah. And many, many of them will use 3D printed uh, examples that they've crafted on a CAD solution before going into a proper build or having oh, these okay. things manufactured, um, you know, manufactured properly you know, in factories. So they're really good for rapid prototyping. Um, they're much stronger than the new UV resin. So... People will print small parts for, um, in fact, I know people uh, on YouTube who create parts for old machinery or old gadgets or old kids' toys, things like that, where you can't buy the parts anymore. Maybe you never could, but you could fabricate one. So they will, they will sort of measure these things out, recreate them in CAD solutions, and then print them, and then basically replace parts using the cool printers. Um, which I think is re- yeah, really cool. Uh, I've seen some fantastic stuff done. With, with these 3D printers in the past. Um, but yeah, the filament ones tend to be better for that because they, like I said, larger print bed and the plastic is, is stronger um, and better for that kind of purpose. Do the you, alternative... Can, can you do oh, something on, after, after they've been printed to smooth them out? Could you like sand it and stuff? I don't know if... That... Oh yeah, yeah, you can. And people do. So yeah. um, if, you, if you go on, online on YouTube and have a look around for people doing sort of uh, impressive 3D printed sort of craft or art, Mm. especially when the mandalorian was at its peak um a couple of years ago there were a lot of people printing mandalorian helmets um and <laughs> like they full size on these yeah yeah like on a large print bed wow so depending on the printer you bought some of them and, and the filament ones more so tend to be much much bigger so you most of the filament ones you'd probably get away with doing a helmet on you might find some of them are slightly too small for a full-size adult helmet most of them will fit one um, it tends to be the height less the width that's the problem. Okay. Um, so you quite often find that um, another thing that people do with 3D printing is they won't necessarily print the file in its normal format. So, you know, you might say, they say if you've got a figure or a statue, mm. you would commonly look at it foot to head, you know, top to bottom, upright. Um, that might not be the best or most efficient way to print it, depending on what you're trying to do. So thinking about just sort of changing the orientation of the object to get a better structure or a better print or a more efficient print is something that a lot of people do. But with the Mandalorian helmets, what they were doing was some of the people would print them in half if that's all their printer could manage or some were doing full-blown prints. And then they would, um, they, 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 you can get like a, a primer. It's like a filler primer. Mm. So it's a spray-on primer that will both, one, prime your model, but two, it's quite thick. So it kind of settles in the lines and then it gives you something you can sand smooth. Um, oh, okay. Or alternatively, you can sand the plastic back, which is another thing that you might want to do, but then you run the risk of thinning the plastic. So they tend to use the filler and then sand that back because then you're just sanding to the original plastic print yep. rather than sanding beyond the plastic and taking resin or plastic or filament away. So, yeah, you can, but you absolutely can. Um, it's painstaking, though, and I think the, the challenge is <laughs> because it can be quite a long and painful process, uh, people don't tend to do it as much on sort of especially small int- int- intricate detail mm. but larger surfaces much much easier if you're trying to sand around square edges or small details that you've tried to print out um then that won't work so well so uh, yeah it can be done though fair enough the alternative method then so you've already seen the filament one in action and mm. you've seen my resin printer although not in action mine is the alternative so i've got a resin printer Mm-hmm. Um, and the way that they work is slightly different. So uh, I always think the resin printers are a bit more like something out of the Terminator because of the way that it works. <laughs> but effectively what you've got with on a, on a standard resin printer is on the base unit, you'll have um, 
uh, a screen, like a, like literally like a phone screen. Mm. Um, that will that is typically I think it's usually black and white, um, and it projects UV light, and it is intended to simply show an image, um, uh, on uh, up, beam an image upwards into a vat of resin. So sitting above the screen will be a small bath of liquid resin, and then I am um, you'll have a your base plate. So instead of a filament printer where the build plate is on the bottom, and the plastic is kind of built up in layers from bottom to top. Actually, the print on a UV resin printer works the other way around. So the base plate is lowered into the resin mm. and then it prints upside down. So um, what happens is the printer, uh, the, the base plate will move into the resin, push right down to the screen, and then the screen will show the first image slice um, or the first layer, sorry, of, mm. of the sliced image to the resin bath. And it will set the resin only where the light is showing on the screen. So wow. if you imagine the two surfaces pushed together, but the base plate has got a very thin layer of resin that is kind of squished between it and the UV screen. The UV screen shows uh, the image and sets the resin only where it needs to. And that takes about anywhere between sort of three to five seconds or, or more. Um, certainly on the, the first few layers, they tend to, to sort of set for longer to get a solid foundation. Mm. Um, every layer will take somewhere between three and five seconds, depending on the resin that you're using. And your printer so you have to a bit like the filament one you kind of have to dial in your preferences the type of material that you're using um but on a resin printer it's all about setting time so your resin sets the uh the build plate then on an arm moves up just a few millimeters to let that resin swash back across the plate again and then it goes back in again uh, and then the image the next layer is shown to the print and it repeats that process over and over and over and over and over again until your hundreds of layers have been printed, at the end of which you will have your suspended from the build plate, hanging upside down, your model dripping with the last sort of bits of unset resin and um, ready for you to take it off the build plate and clean it. So, so they, that, that's the difference between the two um, in terms of how they print. That's insane. I, I had no idea it was that uh, complicated. <laughs> um, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? That is really, really um, impressive. But it's fun to watch on time lapses on YouTube because, like I said, it does look like it doesn't look like something out of a sci-fi movie when you're watching it. It's painstakingly slow when you're watching it, and you can the the frustrating thing is because the bath of resin is usually about an inch deep, maybe mm. slightly less. You don't really see anything until you've invested a good maybe three hours before anything starts really? to emerge. Um, yeah, because so much of your image, your print stays below the uh the, the sort of the, the bath line if you like of the resin but it takes quite a number of layers and dips before the model is at the point where it's sitting above the liquid um or some of it is sitting above the liquid so that the downside i think is if you've cocked up your settings on a filament printer you will know fairly early on and you can stop and save <laughs> yourself some time and save yourself some material if you cock it up on a resin printer you don't know for quite a long time um because you're basically at the mercy of uh you know the first three hours of build time before anything starts to show but when you speed it up on a time lapse it's really fun because it just looks like this plate moves out of the liquid and emerging from the goo is this kind of like shiny glistening dripping model of whatever <laughs> you've picked um and it looks really cool um and really fun so that's that's like fundamentally how the two work um and i think it then and i guess the the one thing that you'll often find people using the UV resin for or more. So it tends to be hobbyists, mm. tends to be people who are into sort of models or miniatures. Um, because the UV resin uh, printers are more expensive, uh, the build plates are considerably smaller mm. um, due to the fact that obviously in order to be able to set the resin, there's got to be a screen. Yeah. And the cost, of, a lot of the costs I'm assuming are built into the screen mm, rather okay. than the mechanism. Whereas a filament printer, it's all about the track dictates how far the printer can move and ultimately the size of the of the work surface you want to put it on you're not really restricted by much else um you know so it's you know it, it's much easier to do i suppose for resin printing when you're relying on a screen the only way to make a bigger build plate is to put a bigger screen in the bigger the screen the more expensive the machine gets um i mean even to replace the screen in the one i've got it's somewhere in the region of about 150 quid Oof. if that once that screen goes how big's got yours, life then? expectancy how big's yeah? your kind of base plate and screen Oh, my build plate is it's so I've got the Elegoom Elegoom Mars 
two, I think it is. I can't remember what the number is, but they're, they're all incremental increases on each other. They do another one called the Elegoo Saturn, which is the bigger one. I did mm. look at that one for a time. The bill plate on mine isn't much bigger than a mobile phone. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, it's, I would say, probably about the size of, a, of your, you know, your iPhone Max. Kind yeah, of. yeah. It's a, a, large, a large iPhone probably is about the size. I could get the measurements, but I didn't take them down. Um, <laughs> so, you know, whereas actually, like, a filament printer, you're probably looking at you know, somewhere in the region of, you know, maybe 30 to 40 centimetres squared yeah. as a starter for 10, and then they get bigger. Um, the other thing that, that makes 3D printing challenging, I guess, is that a filament printer uh, throughout the print process is exposed. It doesn't really give off any fumes. Um, it's not, you know, it's not to be contained in any kind of a box or unit. It just sits and kind of does its thing. With uh, a UV printer, they tend to have to, a uh, resin printer, they have to be encased. And there's two reasons for that. One is because the UV stinks and the fumes <laughs> from the resin are really bad for you. And you'll get a really? really horrific headache if you breathe it in for too long. Yeah, it's, it's quite bad. Um, and the other thing is, of course, it's UV resin. So if it sees UV light, it sets or starts to set. So you have to use it in dark environments, Got you. Uh, typically out of sunlight. But also the, um, what tends to be around these units is like a shroud. And that shroud will have like a UV, res- a, a UV blocking plastic in it to try and reduce the effects of external UV light getting into the, into the print. Interesting. So there's a little bit more. Never thought of that. Yeah, there's a little bit. Well, I hadn't until it all turned up and then I started reading <laughs> into it. Um, so this, this was part of the fun of researching all this because before I bought the one I bought, I did spend maybe about a year or so kind of watching the market, watching them come down in price, getting more reliable because you used to hear horror stories of problems with them and, and, mm. and all those kind of issues. Um, but, you know, it, I settled on one that had, was sort of well-reviewed. It appeared in countless YouTube videos. There's a couple of brands of YouTubers that use these things and they're pretty honest about their feedback on them. Um, and I settled on the one that I did. I, I also will say I got mine on a, you know, a lightning deal on Amazon mm. um, and they had been on countless lightning deals before. Um, interestingly, I've, I've also got the, um, I'll talk about it in a minute, but the, the wash station and curing station from Elegoo, which is a all in one unit. Yep. The, the two are not sold together and were never ever on a lightning deal at the same time, <laughs> but always would go in a lightning deal. Um, and I think the, um, the 3D printer used to have up to 50, 60 pounds off if you picked it up in a lightning deal, which when you're starting around the 280, 290 pound mark, I think I paid 230 for mine. That's um, not bad, actually. And it's a decent discount. Uh, it's worth waiting for. And likewise, I think the curing station was somewhere in the region of 120, mm. lightning deal down to about 90. So, you know, waiting saved me the best part of £80 pound on, on, you know, on that investment. So it's well worth doing your research, finding the one that you like. Um, and if you can get it somewhere like an Amazon, just keep an eye on it for a little while. While you're doing your research, drop it on your wish list mm. and keep tabs on it as it's progressing. And so pricing, um, you just mentioned, you're probably going to come onto it. In, in terms of comparison, but um, that is uh, two thirty actually doesn't surprise doesn't um, sound as as expensive as I was expecting. Uh, I was expecting these to be, you know, four five hundred plus uh, device, especially yeah. if it's more expensive than the filament ones. Um, and so the filament ones are, are cheaper than that then than the two thirty. I gotta be honest and say I don't know, um, mm. which is poor research on my part. But I <laughs> I, I never looked to buy a filament printer because it wasn't. It wasn't to my need. So, as I said before, you know, if, if you're going to sort of summarize the audience for these, typically the UV resin printers are targeted sort of towards hobbyists. Um, and, and by that, I mean kind of like miniature hobbyist game, get tabletop gaming, painters, people like that. Of course, you can use them in the ways that we described earlier to print small parts and things like that. But UV resin, even the really, um, the really reliable sort of dense stuff, it's still quite brittle compared to the stuff that the filament printers can produce. Yeah. Time to print takes longer. And of course, the environment, as I mentioned earlier, tends to be a lot more complicated to print in. Um, whereas for the filament printer, the quality is not really there. You couldn't do the fine detail miniatures, or at least you couldn't when I was looking. They've probably come on a bit since then, but mm. it's still more challenging to do the fine, fine detail at scale, the kind of scale that you're talking about for tabletop gaming. Um, and, and because of that, you know, you're not going to get miniatures that look or feel very good. Um, and, and they're not going to be to the hobbyist needs. Rather, they're more, in, more used for, uh, like I said, prototyping parts and things like that. So 
when I was looking at them, my interest was from the hobbyist perspective. I mean, part of it was just because I like new tech and I like interesting tech and I like to try these things out. Um, and I still do have this ambition in my head to learn a Blender or, or a, a similar tool and make something in 3D and then bring it to life um, you know, in the physical world. I really love that idea. We've gone, we've gone from trying to take everything in our physical world and make it digital. And we've now developed processes that allow us to think in digital and then create something physical. And I just think that's really cool. Um, that is cool. At the moment, I, have, I will admit that my printing experience has been limited to purchases that I've made online and 3D files that I've created or printed, not ones that I have built from the ground up. Um, that still remains a, 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 a to-do list item. Um, and I will mention as well, um, I, was, I was inspired actually to give credit to the creator. There's a, a YouTuber that many creative fans will know called Jazza, who's an Australian artist. Um, and he's got a very, he's got a number of channels now, including one dedicated to tabletop gaming called Tabletop Time. But I was first inspired with 3D printing by him. Um, and he did this really cool video where he took um, a Warhammer miniature mm. uh, that he really liked, that he wanted to recreate. Um, but print on a larger scale. And then he used virtual reality headsets. Um, I think it was the, um, it was one of the Valve Index headsets, I think. Oh, yeah. And he used uh, a 3D sculpting program to sculpt in 3D in virtual reality. So he's like, using these tools and he's crafting this object in 3D. He's moving around it. He's taking a bit off there, taking, adding a bit here. And he built this, um, I'm going to call him a blood angel. I could have completely cocked that up in terms of the, the backstory of this character but it looked like one of those kind of blood angel uh warhammer characters to me and he remade this model so he used like photo references in vr made it all in 3d exported the 3d file printed it constructed it and then painted it in the real world and he had a model i don't know probably 50 times larger than the warhammer model like a proper <laughs> large scale tabletop figurine that he created statue um, and there's a full video of him doing it end to end. It's fascinating to watch. Uh, and that was where I sat there and thought, wow, that's amazing. This guy has taken something in his head. He's made it, he's sculpted it in VR, you know, in virtual reality. So he's used these really cutting edge futuristic tools. And then he's used a 3D printer, which in itself, 20 years ago, sounded like magic. <laughs> when someone first <laughs> yeah. told me you could print 3D objects, it sounded like magic until I understood how it worked. Um, and then he painted it. And so he'd gone from something that was completely in his head, albeit he copied a figure, and right the way through to ending with a large, very large, printed bust. And, and as someone who, as a child, I used to paint uh, a lot of miniatures. I never played the games particularly, but I used to love buying and painting the miniatures. The number of times when I would look at a miniature and go, oh, it'd be so cool to have, you know, this on that figure. Or you'd watch a film and go, oh, God, I'd love to paint you know, those characters as miniatures and then have them in like, I used to make a lot of sort of terrain and stuff as kids for them, mm. really crappy stuff, but I used to love doing it. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that now with the right tools that all of that is possible, just think it's incredibly cool. It's definitely come a long way. I, I'm actually blown away about the, the price. Um, I wrote off 3D printing in my mind many years ago because I just assumed it was far too expensive, mm. um, even on a hobbyist uh, kind of front. But, yeah, I just quickly hopped on Amazon a second ago, as you were saying about the prices, Dangerous. just to see what it looks like. And I'm <laughs> amazed at how many, you know, under £200 uh, sets you can get for, for printing, both filament and UV, mm. it looks like. Um, it, it, it has really come down. I mean, even in the years, I mean, I've had mine now two years, I think. Mm. And I was late to the game. The Elegoo Mars was far from the cutting edge latest device at that point. But again, I was I read I watched a lot of videos, um, did a lot of research as to what was the right thing for me, and I I had to resist the temptation as a techie to buy the most technically advanced thing that I could to serve my hobby. Um, so you know these you'll see if you're looking at them now on, on Amazon and, and you know anyone listening do a quick search yourself. They range wildly. You know you can absolutely get into this for two or three hundred pounds if you get super serious about it and you want large big chunky printers then you won't find them on amazon you'll find them on specialist dealers and they will run you into the thousands you know they, they really can go to that kind of level um but most people don't need that for home use and for sort of like i said if you're just doing miniatures and you're having a bit of fun with it 
you don't need to spend that kind of money. And I've had a lot of fun and a lot of satisfaction with mine, even mm. though I've used it sparingly. And I'll, I'll kind of explain why that is the case shortly. But um, yeah, it's it's much cheaper than you'd expect. It's not much more expensive than a decent photo printer these mm. days to get yeah, yeah. get started. Um, and the materials that go with it aren't expensive either. So ju- I guess just to sort of flesh out my my journey with this, so that you, you know what you might need to get started. I bought the Elegoo Miles printer. Um, and as I said, I think I paid two thirty for it. So you know, if you can find them for around that figure, that's great value. Mm. Um, and there's a handful of makes out there that that are well thought of. I mean, I'd avoid the ones that you don't hear anyone talk about because there's probably <laughs> a reason for that. But there's a handful that that are, are you know well covered on YouTube. Just do a quick search before you buy anything. Check it out. See what someone else makes of it. And just you know, validate that against your own needs. As well as the printer. Um, so there's a little bit of stuff to consider. Obviously, you'll need to buy the resin, um, and I can't, I kind of can't talk to the sort of PLA and the, the filament stuff that you need for the the other printers. Um, but I think it's similarly priced. It's not, again, it's not a barrier to entry. Yeah. Um, one isn't massively more expensive than the other, but for resin, you're talking in the region of twenty to thirty pound for a bottle, um, and a good size bottle will, like mine, will do um, many many prints. I am nowhere near using the, the resin that I've bought, and I've probably done, I've done, I've done six or seven reasonable prints you know bigger than your average miniature um but not massive and i haven't really pushed it to the limits but you know that resin will run you a long time so you're going to get value for money you're not going to print something off and go oh wow it would have been much cheaper to have bought something like that you know in the shop (laughs) it's always going to be cheaper to print it if you've already got the printer and you made that investment the liquid you know the actual cost per gallon or whatever you end up using is not going to be that expensive so the resin's pretty cheap the other thing you need to consider, and there are lots of different ways to do this, is with a resin printer is how you're going to cure the resin. So even though the machine is curing it as it's printing, it does need a final cure when it comes out. So you have to take the the um, the print head off, detach the models with a bit of force. It always surprises me how much force you have to put into separating the plastic from the, the metal base plate. Um, and then you have to wash it. Uh, and then that will, and how you wash it will depend on the type of resin you buy. So I went for uh, water washable resin um, rather than resin that would perhaps need uh, I, um, IPA. Okay. Uh, so because at that, if you if you use that, obviously you're going to burn through a lot more uh, materials. You're mm. having to wash everything in, in isopropyl alcohol. Uh, whereas I bought the water cleaning stuff, which was slightly more expensive for the resin, but then it means I didn't have to have a bath of IPA ready to, to clean it with afterwards. Yep. Um, so that's something to consider. And then once you've washed it, and there's various ways you can do that, you can literally do it in a, in a Tupperware. Mm. Um, you don't need a fancy equipment. I bought, um, I don't know what the actual product name is. I don't want to call it. The, it looks like Mercury from where I'm sitting. I think it's the Elegy Mercury. Um, and it's a, it's a combination wash and curing station. So it does two things. You can put a big vat, big Tupperware size water container that comes with it and a little basket. You put your model inside it and then it spins the water using magnets just to kind of create, I guess, a washing effect around the model. Mm. And you can do that. Um, or, like I said, you can just put it by hand or with some gloves. Point that out. Yeah, Absolutely yeah. should have gloves on. You can do it in, in, in a bowl of water. You don't actually need a machine. And then to cure it, you do need some sort of UV light. Now, you could take it outside. If you're in a nice, warm environment and the sun's out, the sun yeah. will do a great job. Put it on the windowsill. <laughs> put it on the windowsill. That'll be fine. Um, if you live in Britain where the sun very rarely comes out, <laughs> you need another alternative. So I, uh, I have, as I said, the Elegoo Mercury, and what the Mercury's got is a, a rotating base plate and a strip of UV lights that run up the back of it, and you put the, uh, your model in, you put the lid on, and you turn it on for just five or six minutes, and it will just turn on that base plate and expose itself to the UV lights. Uh, yeah, you're showing it on screen there for anyone uh, watching on YouTube, um, and it will just cure the model for you. Uh, so if you don't want to buy one of those, then I've seen people use uh, like nail lamps that would cure uh, nail gels. So if you're, you know, you're the half or if you own a nail lamp, you can use that or you can buy those relatively cheaply on Amazon as well. So there are different ways that you can get around this, um, but you do need to think about those additional, um, those additional equipment. You're not just going to buy the resin printer and off you go. Uh, whereas I think with the filament printer, it is much simpler. You don't need any of those things. The yeah. filament, once the plastic is has re has, has cooled back to room temperature and is set again, job done. You know you can literally pop it off the plate and use it instantly. 
So again, that might play into your decision in terms of what you're going to do. Um, and I will say that you have to be really careful with resin. So I wasn't, um, I was aware of this before I bought mine, but I wasn't aware when I started the research just how careful you have to be. If you get resin on anything, it makes a right mess of it, whether that's your clothes, a tabletop, you know. Um, so you'll quite often see uh, people on who are using these things, using things like tr specifically dedicated trays to put things on. So if they mm. do drip the resin anywhere, it doesn't matter. You do have to clean the resin bath every time you finish using it. So, you know, you'll try and recycle your resin back in. You'll pour it back into your bottle, but you'll do it through a strainer because you don't want any loose bits of yeah. cured resin that might have broken off during the print and getting back into your clean resin. You have to wash the the base um, and, and clean it all thoroughly, let it all dry accordingly. Um, you do all of that with gloves on and probably a mask, realistically, because mm. the fumes are quite strong. Um, so there is that side of things to consider. Again, the filament printers much much simpler. There's none of that uh, to worry about. Um, you know, I think you have to clean the nozzle, but that's about it, really. Yeah. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. So that that might factor into your into your purchasing decisions as well. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I'm looking at them. <laughs> I don't. I don't even have a use case, but I I want to give it a try now. <laughs> um, Do you know what that was really? That was my thing, and I kind of made a use case. Yeah. I got back into model painting through COVID, um, and it's been really good fun. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, Robbie, obviously you know that you introduced me uh, about eight, nine months ago now to the world of Dungeons and & Dragons. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I, I went through the process of creating a character in order to join you on a campaign with some friends, and, um, and I decided I would make that character. And um, I think there's a website for anyone who's kind of a, a budding uh, as either D and D player or just tabletop gamer, uh, who's thinking about getting into the three D printing, there's a website called Hero Forge. Um, I don't know if you've had a go with it yourself, Robbie. I know yep. you're familiar with it. Um, so for those who don't know, Hero Forge is basically a, a website where you can go and use their their sort of uh, their builder, their, their toolkit to create your own custom miniatures from a m huge range of presets. You can change your race. You can uh, change the outfits that they're wearing, the stance, the weapons, the objects that sit around them, uh, the pose that they're in. And then you basically can, you can spend hours doing this, and it's, it's really interesting and it's a lot of fun. Think about like a custom character creator in a video game. It's that to the nth degree. And what you basically do is you assemble all these components, build and pose your character. And then when you're ready, you simply uh, either choose to have it printed by the company and shipped to you, um, or for a little bit less, you can just buy the STL file and download that 3D file, and then you've got it forever. And you can scale it uh, to whatever sort of size you need for your print, and then print it off at home. Um, so I did exactly that, and I, I printed my character. I posed him, printed him, um, set him on like a little stand with some uh, wolves that I purchased from another website, and, and created a miniature. Um, and it was it was a lot of fun to go yeah. from kind of designing that in a browser to printing it at home washing cleaning priming it um there's something really sad i bought um transparent resin uh yes. no particular reason it was just yeah, the yeah. one that i bought uh, it's like a transparent blue and it's really satisfying i've got to say <laughs> when you hit it with that first coat of spray primer and all of a sudden that transparency disappears and you can see all the detail yeah because it's very hard to get in and, and and sort of really admire the level of detail that you can print on these things but when you hit it with that coat of primer and it solidifies in front of you. It's it's fascinating, really exciting. Um, yeah. So that, that that was a really interesting use case. Um, That's and, true. And I mean, all... that is something that I could get into as well. I mean, I've never been one for the the print uh, the painting of miniatures, but I did. I, I designed uh, my character as well on Hero Forge, but I did pay for them to to ship it. In fact, no, I think um, one of our campaign members paid for it to ship it to him because he was going to paint it all. So we're going to have all of our campaign members uh, painted eventually. Uh, shout out Distractables, uh, our little campaign team um but yeah just um, i love platforms like that that you can go on and design your own characters it's a bit like um skyrim as you say when you design your character you choose your race and you, the various features and weapons and and um, what have you really good for D and other tabletop games um i suppose that is my only other exposure to 3d printing even though i didn't see the process myself you got to design your own little characters for it yeah really big fan of that so i'll actually include the, the link to that in the, the show notes as well for anyone else who wants to check it out and you know, if if you're if you're thinking about if you're into the sort of miniatures and you're you're thinking about a three D printer, I will say don't be put off by by kind of the idea of having to create this stuff yourself. If you're not a creative person or you don't have a raft of characters in your mind that you want to create, or you don't want to go and learn Blender, 
there are a huge amount of online resources where people, talented artists, are creating this stuff all the time that you can just go and buy. So there's a website called uh, My Mini Factory is one that is particularly good for this sort of stuff. Mm. And people upload all sorts of fantastic stuff on there. Sometimes it's for free. Um, and you can just download it, which is great, kind of community items. And other people, quite rightly, uh, talented artists who've, who've spent hours slaving over these files, will ask for very little in terms of cost to buy them. Um, in fact, there was an example. There's a book series that uh, my daughter um, has been reading that I bought her called Fart Quest. Um, Great it name. sounds really childish, and it <laughs> absolutely is. But it's basically a child's entry into D&D, so it's a fantasy quest, uh, which has some of the traits of D&D and some kind of... Um, and they say slightly tweaked characters or, or familiar uh, creatures that you might come across in D&D scaled down for sort of and suitable to children. And she got really into this series. And the, the guy who had written the books worked with an artist and had the characters created as 3D files that you could buy on my mini factory. So I, did, I bought them and printed them for her. And she had them um, as one of her little birthday presents. That, and I bought her some basic model paints to get her started because she's quite artistic. And she started painting them. Um, and she's, she really likes it. She's not quite Great as into idea. it. I perhaps hope she would, but she enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you can, you can get so much on there. And the other thing that uh, is quite common is that you've got some really good artists who are running these patrons, where if you sign up to their patrons and you, you sort of contribute to mm. help keep their studio or their, them, I guess their art alive, you then get like a subscription and, and they'll send you new STL files every month that you can then choose to print and pick and choose from. Um, you can even import these things into tools like Blender and cut and slice them together and, and create your own from other people's uh, you know, art to start off with. It, it's just, you know, the, the opportunities there and the options are limitless. So something um, I have seen actually in that it. space, um, and it's a friend of mine got it for his one of his board games, is, and it's a big thing on Etsy at the moment, to sell like board game organizers for, you know, particularly okay, large yeah. games. Uh, for example, Talisman is a really big game, especially if you have all the ex- um, expansions. There's tons of decks of cards, lots of tokens and things they have to keep on top of. And so Etsy, I've seen lots of 3D printed organizers where it's like a, uh, it's a little tray specific for each little deck of cards that you might have or each yeah. bit of token. And there's loads of, I've seen quite a few actually of add-ons of, of games to help keep things organized just out there. Um, I, guess, I guess there's a market on there for STL specific yeah. for games. Well, um, it's a really interesting uh, sideline to get into when you think about it. So... I imagine those are probably more like to be filament printed mm. um, just because of the size of them. Um, and they, they, they don't need to be fine detail. I guess these yeah. things you know, can be rough and ready. In fact, I bought a dice tower for our D&D oh, game. Yes, yeah, yeah. I was getting a lot of stick for not using real dice um, and using <laughs> uh, on, online dice. So I bought a dice tower. And um, when it turned up, as I expected it would, it, was, it absolutely was a filament printed mm. object. Um, it's quite large. You know, it's definitely not come off a UV printer. And you can see the, the print lines very faintly, but you know, for what it costs and what I use it for, I really don't care. Um, but what's interesting is, there's, and I know there are people who've done this, there's almost this kind of on-demand print service that's associated with this. Mm. So what a lot of people do is they'll have these kind of web stores, like an Etsy, yeah. they'll have the objects on there for, for, for purchase. And then when someone makes that purchase, they'll either have automated it or manually, they'll trigger that print job. Um, and right they might idea. have like four or five printers on a bench They'll get one of those printers moving, you know, five, six, ten hours later, whatever the size of the object is, that print is complete. They take it off, they put it in a box, and they ship it out. So they never sat on excess inventory. They've never got things that they can't sell or things that go to waste. Loads of storeroom stuff held up. They just print them on demand as they're needed, um, and which is why it was interesting when I bought that skull, and I didn't think about it at the time. It occurred to me to before, while it was shipping. I thought, that's odd. On Amazon, normally these things are like, you know, almost everything's prime next day now yeah, yeah. this wasn't it. it was um it was like it had like a week lead time yeah and i thought oh that's interesting and i guess that's because if they don't have it already printed on a shelf waiting to go or if their business model is as i've just described they'll do the on demand and then they'll ship it straight out to you that's a great um, idea well it is i mean you think about it you could you could stockpile some really good stl files that are particularly useful and i've seen this um so you know very clearly from my background mm. you know, watching on youtube i have a lot of nerdy video games there are loads of really cool little ways to display your cartridges and your video games that have been designed by people with 3D printers and they'll have done them in like CAD and then they've you know, printed them and produced them as, as products. Um, so like little stands to display, to display your Super Nintendo games on that will yeah, yeah. stack them at just the right height so that the labels show one behind the other. 
and you create this kind of concertina effect of your games. Um, I've seen loads of things for like the Nintendo Switch. There's a huge number of things on Etsy and, and eBay and other places where people have created fantastic products that like you know will connect your Switch. There's one. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's one. So you'd be familiar with the Nintendo Switch and the Joy Cons. You've got one. Yep. You know how that works. So for anyone who doesn't know, the Joy Cons are kind of detachable controllers from the main body of the Switch, and these are designed to slot into um, a cup holder. So they slot in at just the right angle that you could hold a can of pop or you know your cup between the two controllers and then take a drink as you're playing. <laughs> That's genius. Yeah, and sort of things like that. It's just think it's fantastic. So, but all of that is enabled by you know, the, the 3D printing, which has given creators and designers a brand new outlet for their work. I think it's. I just think it's brilliant. Can't say enough good things about it. I think it's so clever. Um, and it's just. It's a bit like you know. Um, YouTube has allowed people to make content at home who wanted to be TV directors or movie directors or whatever. Mm. Now they can make this content at home and they can they can learn the tools because we've got all these fantastic cameras and you know, hardware and software makes it available. Now you've got tools that designers um, and engineers can build. I mean, I'll tell you what's fascinating is to go, and it blows my mind because I'm not intelligent enough to do this. There are some fantastic engineers on YouTube who just build the most ridiculous things Oh, and they use 3D seen... printing as a big part of that workflow. Like useless invention stuff. There's a guy I oh, follow on him on Instagram. Yeah, he's, I've seen. he's got some fantastic stuff. Um, but it's all 3D printed things that he yeah. makes the designs himself. And I think one of the things that he's got, and he keeps adding to it, is he's got a coffee table that's uh, made out of uh, puzzle pieces, like really large plastic puzzle pieces. And he keeps adding things to it. So he's got like a, a ball that specifically fits into a puzzle piece. So he can have his like chips in there. Is uh is crisps, uh, and then he can also have a specific like, uh, remote control holder that goes into a different uh, puzzle piece somewhere on the coffee table. It's it's super super clever, and he's designed it and printed it all himself. Um, and I say, isn't it? And it, it, you know, it's so easy to do now. Um, if you've got that mindset and you've got the ideas, I just think it's, you know, and and so that and we're, we've kind of gone from one type to we've flipped from UV resin to fil filament here, but. Mm. These are all fantastic use cases for a filament printer. Yeah. And to be honest, you know, if I had the time um, to build or design something, I, I would love to do that. And what I also, um, I saw one the other day, there's a guy, another guy you should watch if you don't already, called I Like to Make Stuff um, on YouTube. And he does a lot of woodwork typically, but he also has a 3D printer and he does some fascinating things in that space. And he, he did something really simple the other day. And um, he was looking to build a better set of practice, net, uh, practice football goal for his kids. Okay wherever you are in the world. And he wanted to remodel the ones that he'd bought or the ones that his kids already got and do it better. So what he did was he got electro electrical conduit, like the metal um, piping that you'd put your electrical wires through. Mm. And he bought a whole load of that. And then he, he took meticulous measurements and then he created a whole load of different joint types to allow him to effectively turn them into sort of like, um, now I'm not going to say Lego because that's not the right example, but, you know, like just... It all, it all sort of just push fit together. Mm. And he was creating clips and angle joints and hinges, all of which was just printed from three, you know, 3D printed uh, files that enabled him to create this, this series of interconnectable pipes and tubes that not only could they use to make this uh, football goal, but then he gave the files to some of the team and, said, and challenged them to come up with their own ideas and how they could use the combination of bog standard off-the-shelf electrical conduit and these plastic joints to create all sorts of manner of objects. And I thought that was just genius. You've mm. taken this object that you can get super cheap and then you've used your skills to design something in 3D and print it that has allowed you to bring those two together and create an entirely new way of utilizing that product. Um, and, and yeah, just that sort of thing is fascinating to me. And like I said earlier, people just print a designing and printing replacement parts um, to bring, you know, to repair an object or even to to fabricate an entirely new part to bring two previously disconnected objects together in some meaningful way yeah i just think that 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 is uh and the rapid nature of that prototyping is just uh fascinating you know, the yeah. speed at which you can go from an idea to having a product ready to show someone is that astonishing is i love the idea of printing components as well because that's the big thing about 3d printing that i thought was the most interesting is that you mentioned before about the bigger uh, printers obviously more expensive but in, in some circumstances, you don't even need to do that. You just have to print out the components and then build them all together. Like, for example, your your miniatures, um, you would typically get them in in pieces, wouldn't you? And you'd have to 
build them together anyway, even yeah, the yeah. super small ones. So if you had a particularly big miniature that you want to do, um, you could theoretically, I imagine, just do the component parts and then fix them together. I'll um, tell you what blew your mind, and this, this blew my mind. So someone has, uh, well, many people now, but I watched a video quite a while ago, someone creating a 3D file that was then, when printed, was um, articulated. So I don't know if you remember as a child, you may well have had a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle action figure or the like. Mm. Um, and if you remember, these, they often fell apart. They were in two halves, effectively, and the arms and legs would sort of slot into little grooves in yeah. the body. Then they would be locked in by sealing the shell. Well, the two pieces, not the shell. I'm a bad example with the turtles. But you know what I mean? By gluing the two halves, the front and back of the body together, and then the arms and the legs would kind of just sort of move in the hinges as part yeah. of that complete these so i saw someone printing this and i thought first of all i thought oh that's clever they've kind of remodeled a turtle they're printing the different parts and they're going to build the body but it was more than that what they actually did was they designed these pieces together to print in such a way that when you took it off the printer and you broke the support that the model was already together <laughs> so those arms and legs were printed pre pre-fitted inside the joint yeah yeah with just enough maneuverability that once you broke it all off the print bed the arms and legs were completely immovable, but the body was a solid. So there was no two halves coming together. Those legs and arms were printed all ready to go that's with full wild. movement inside the model. It that's just good. blew that's... my mind. I was like, how do you even design that? That's some wild engineering, that is. Yeah. Uh... And they did it in a clear resin so you could see kind of what was happening. A translucent resin. Not clear, yeah. You know what I mean? Ah, yeah, fascinating. Genius. That, that has mm. blown my mind. That's really cool. So you must have to have like a couple of layers not many layers just sticking the arms together so when you get it out you just break their arms well, yeah. basically and they but start moving if you think about it it's, that means <laughs> there's, there's like this small joint which then has that, the, the bits inside is actually printed and connected through and then printed on the outside of the other part of the print job how did they design that so that yeah and, and when they took it off the print bed literally without any real effort it just suddenly wobbled and started moving in place <laughs> as you'd expect it to and I've seen other, That's like, there's crazy. lots of other stuff. If you, if you, you know, if you ever sit and get bored and do a Google search, you'll find loads of it. Um, but people doing things like that where they're creating objects that are kind of ready assembled and mm. interlinking in some sort of clever way. You can print like chain mail um, <laughs> and have it come off and be movable and all those printed segments are linked together. Yeah, yeah. Because um, they were printed as a whole. It's really, it's really clever. That's wild. Um, it, go, it goes deeper and deeper. Um, I'm conscious of time, Robin. I don't know how long we've been going for because I've, I've gone way out, off script yeah. here and we've gone all over the place. But there were a couple of things I just wanted to, to, to sort of call out, I guess, to finish. And what I will do, if we've not covered it in any way, is I, there's, there's loads of articles out there that talk about the pros and cons of these printers. Mm. So if you are thinking about buying one and you're not sure which way to go, I would absolutely encourage you to go and do a bit of research. We've got one we'll put in the uh, show notes to save you hassle, but, but do do your research. A couple of things I wanted to call out if you're thinking about going down the resin route. Um, you know, first of all, as we mentioned earlier, think about what it is that you're looking to buy a printer for. So, you know, is it miniatures? Is it fine detail? Are you, you know, if it is, then you probably want a resin printer. If you're looking at product prototyping or printing parts or designing pieces of, uh, of equipment, filament printers are going to be your friend, larger scale printing and, and, and more rigid plastic. I mentioned the fumes with the resin printer earlier, and, and I, this was a lesson that I learned the hard way, unfortunately. When I bought mine, um, I assumed that just putting a mask on and being around it would be enough. Um, and it does. It works. You can wear the mask to, to interact with the machine when it's printing. The problem with it is, unless you've got a really well-ventilated room, uh, that room will fill up with that smell pretty quickly and um, mean that going in and out of the room that your printer is in is a challenge without the mask. Now, I made the mistake. I've got one large sort of office space here slash nerd room. My crafting bench is in the same room. So that's where the printer lives, which is the reason why I don't use the printer very often is because in order to use it, I have to take the room out of out of function, basically, for anything else. But anything up to, you know, well, anything from five to six hours or up um, to do a simple print. Um, and that's a problem because... It means I can't use the room to work. I, I work from home here for my job. I play in here. I record things with Robbie in here. Like, it's not practical to take this room out for that longer time. Um, I did try to combat it. I bought uh, an extractor fan, um, and I and I set that up, and that did work. The problem is the way that I set it up in this room. It was just a bit cumbersome, and it kind of got in the way. If you could do that in such a way that it was kind of 
hidden or neat and tidy or, or you know in, unobtrusive then you absolutely should have some sort of extractor fan to to make the room usable while the printer's working um mm. the machines do pump the air out of a specific vent so it's quite easy to capture um but you do need to have that and at the moment i'll be honest and say i don't have a proper external um ventilation where i need it in this room i don't even have a window in this room because of the type of room it is and how it was converted i've got a i've got a window but not an opening window so mm. it's kind of fling a door open or nothing at all so well ventilated spaces are a must and just bear that in mind when you buy a resin printer because you can't put them in your living room and just turn them on because then the living room will be full of an incredibly potent smell that gives you a really bad headache you need to dedicate space um, something i did see and it was just after checking it out on amazon um is some of them are starting to be sold with air purifiers like built into them um i don't know if you've had any experience trying those out but um i haven't mine mine's well mine has i don't know i'd be interested to see what they say about that because the Allegu mars has got an air filter and one of those little carbon mesh uh, that you put across the the vent to try and filter out some of the smell yeah it, it doesn't work now whether these <laughs> okay. things are more sophisticated now then they might well be um, and they probably take some of the edge off because don't get me wrong if you just put your head in where the vat of the resin is it's really strong yeah but putting the box on you know and then turning the machine on it, it you know it it does lessen the smell but you do need a bit more to, to sort of deal with that i mean mm. maybe l- much larger machines will have much better air purification but um i, I found that mine didn't really didn't really do that um, is it is that is so this um kind of stick looking thing is that the one that you had the, the elgu one as well this one uh yes but i don't have that stick looking thing oh okay so that's the air purifier i think because it sits right where the vent is um oh, that's interesting. it does look like a little ac unit just stuck in this inside this resin yeah tank. i mean that's tiny as well because if it doesn't look it on the image that you're showing on screen there it's um for scale you know if that is the mars is that the saturn or the mars saturn oh that's the saturn so that's a larger print bed that might not actually be quite as small as it looks it uh, looks a bit like there. the size of like a usb stick and it does I actually have a usb on the other side so i'm assuming it, it you plug it into where it yeah yeah it's not very big though is it no it's um, not that's why i was wondering if you had any yeah, experience of it see if that i'd worked. be surprised if that does a great deal more than what's in in this now but uh as i said it shouldn't stop you it's just something to bear in mind you know if you get a filament printer aside from the noise you can put it anywhere and run it anytime um uv resin printers not so much they do need a dedicated space they do let off quite pungent fumes and you should absolutely wear a mask and gloves you have to have, um can't just be any old gloves as well they do recommend a certain type of glove to protect you from the resin mm. um now i've never got it on my hands and i'm I'm sure it's not going to like burn a finger off or something horrific but it's still you know it's a it's a it's a liquid that cures to a solid plastic in sunlight i don't think i want that in my skin no or in my body to be honest so you just need to be a bit careful with it um and consider those things uh, as i said i think i would suggest starting small um I don't regret my purchase on the cheaper end. I think it's the sensible way to go when you know, you're not sure whether this is going to be something for you. You can always upgrade. You'll never regret having two 3D printers because if you like doing <laughs> working with one and you want a better one, I'm sure you'll always find a use for these. Um, but yeah, then you can start to look at the 4Ks, the 8Ks, etc. And then it becomes about the speed of the machines. Mm. You're always going to be constrained, though. One thing to point out, you're always constrained by the resin that you choose. <laughs> it doesn't matter how fast the machine says it is. If your resin takes three seconds to cure, it takes three seconds to cure. There's yeah. nothing the machine can do about that. So, um, you know, there are certain things that you just need to know about the process to understand how to read through the, uh, some of the sales speak and some of these machines and, and pick the right one for you. But, but otherwise, I think, um, oh, and that's sort of the last thing that I've got here, which I do think is important, is just the environmental aspect of both. So, you know, the, there can be wastage with both of these machines regardless of what you do and also there is uh, with the resin one specifically you've got to be really careful how you dispose of that resin mm. um, you can't just pour it down the drain for very obvious reasons um you know, this stuff is is bad for the environment you don't want it in your water source yeah so just consider all aspects of of the how you dispose of these things and also you know 3d printing is great and it's a lot of fun but you know if you're just printing one th- even on a filament printer one thing after another and these things just end up in a pile it's plastic um it's plastic waste whatever you do with it so yep. it is just worth factoring that in you know i wouldn't want to be seen as encouraging people just to buy these things and print any old junk for the sake of printing 
print them if you've got a genuine need for them and try not to waste more than you you absolutely need to mm. um and absolutely follow all the instructions when it comes to disposing of the resin because it's the, the temptation just to sort of wash it down the sink like you might the water based paint or something like that especially as a, as a crafter you're someone who works in that space you know often washing away water water based paints no bother you don't want this going down your sink. You don't want this in your water system. So um, follow all the relevant instructions and dispose of it carefully. Yeah. And that's it, really. I think we've probably gone to time. There's loads more we could say about 3D printing. Um, hopefully you found that interesting, Robbie, and a bit of a, a journey through the research I did. Fast track you to a decision point, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't interested in 3D printing before. Now I'm genuinely looking <laughs> at, uh, as, as I always do when You're I'm talking to you. You're not supposed to say that. We're, <laughs> this is our episode. It's our podcast. You're supposed to be enthusiastic about all of our topics. Well, no, I am. But, uh, the, no, I mean, this one's driven me to look up, uh, well, wanting me to research more, basically, more than any of the other topics I think we've chatted about. So, um, yeah, uh, really, really else, interesting. It's, it's worth watching videos of other people doing it just to see the fascinating stuff people can do with these tools. Even if you never buy one, um, just go in and, and watch what some of these amazingly creative people are doing with them. I do not put myself in that bucket. I'm a tech enthusiast. I bought it for the fun and to try it out. But there are some genuinely talented people out there doing some amazing things with these devices. And, and it's just fun to watch some of the amazing content they create on YouTube as well. So just do, do some basic searching around. Find some, some YouTubers that you like and watch what they're up to. And, and absolutely... Um, go and I'm not sponsored. <laughs> go and seek out Jazz's video um, from a couple of years ago when he did that Space Marine. Uh, it was yeah, just really inspirational to watch uh, someone go from you know an idea in their mind in a virtual world to a final 3D masterpiece. You know, and and it was just great, absolutely great. Excellent. So that's it for this time. Thank you very much for stopping by. I hope you found that interesting. Perhaps a little bit different to episodes we've done before. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe on youtube it genuinely helps share it as well tell someone if you enjoyed it and get them to watch as well we could do with it um check us out on all good podcast services where everywhere that you would typically expect to find us and you can also find us on twitch uh, three times a week where we stream a variety of games from old and new and just basically mess around and show how genuinely bad sometimes robbie and i are at uh, <laughs> most modern video games uh, but that's it we'll see you uh, for episode 16 thanks a lot